I think we're going to begin, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to our very special event tonight, the 19th Annual Reading for the Pennsylvania Public Poetry Project. My name is Elisa Cahoy. And I am very proud to serve as an assistant director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. Now, just to let you know before we get started, following our event tonight, we will have a book sale and also a poster signing. And we will have these gorgeous posters available for you to take with you and get signed as well for free after the event. So be sure and stick around for that. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of some people in the room, and I ask you to just hold your applause until the end. First and foremost, we would like to thank Dean Barbara Dewey. If you could just wave your hand. Thank you for always sponsoring the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, and thank you for your support of this event, too. We would also like to say thank you to our Associate Dean, Karen Esland. Thanks, Karen. And thank you to our Public Poetry Advisory Board members, Bill Brockman, Jose Guerrero, Julia Kasdorf, Shara McCallum, Caitlin Rizzo, and Christopher Walker for their guidance and support. Thank you to the English Department for their sponsorship of the event. Thank you to Libraries, Public Relations, and Marketing. And I want to give a very special thank you to their intern, Colin Gallagher. Colin, could you stand for us? Yay, there's Colin. Colin is an intern. He is a Penn State senior design major from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and he created these beautiful posters that you all will receive tonight. So let's give him a, his own round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for your incredible work. Thank you to our outreach coordinator, Caroline Wermuth, and to the faculty and staff of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. Thanks to our 2019 Public Poetry Project Selection Committee, Paula Bohintz, poet, Thomas Devaney, poet and visiting assistant professor of English at Haverford College, and Marcy Nelligan, poet and coordinator of an arts and education partnership between Millersville University and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. We are indebted to our selection committee, and we're indebted to each of them for sharing their expertise with us. Thank you. And so now, a round of applause for everyone in our thanks tonight. We also have a very, very special announcement to make tonight, and I am so excited to announce this. We recently completed fundraising for the Literary, Literary Legacy Fund at the Pennsylvania Center for the Book in honor of our emeritus director, Dr. Stephen Herb's retirement. And we are pleased to announce that our fund has reached its goal and a permanent endowment has been established to help programs that Stephen created, like the Public Poetry Project, continue into the future. Thank you to all of our generous donors, some of whom I know are in the room. And now on to our main event. The Public Poetry Project focuses on poets with a connection to Pennsylvania, 
and displays the poetry in public places to make it a part of the daily lives of a greater number of people. Since the project began in 2000, 85 individual poems have been printed and placed in public places throughout Pennsylvania. And tonight, we will showcase four poets and poems selected by our judges for this honor. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Bill Brockman, Paterno Family, Librarian for Literature, and our MC for tonight's program. Thanks, Lisa. And special thanks to Nicole Miyashiro for providing me with biographical information about our readers tonight, and to Carolyn Wormuth for running the show, <laughs> keeping us all together. Poetry has been all over the news lately, with the headline, Poetry Sales Soar as Political Millennials Search for Clarity, the Guardian newspaper reported that sales of poetry books rose dramatically in the UK last year. <clears throat> the recent death of W.S. Merwin and the 100th birthday of Lawrence Ferlinghetti were widely reported in the media. In a recent editorial in the New York Times, our U.S. Poet Laureate, Tracy K. Smith, wrote an opinion piece noting the rise in politically oriented poetry. In responding to Wordsworth's famous definition of poetry as emotion recollected in tranquility, Smith concludes that, I suggest that lately it seems concerned with seeking revelation not in privacy, but in community, not in the meditative mind, but in bustling bodies in shared space, in the transactions our physical selves are marked and marred by. In this evening's public poetry reading, we're here to celebrate the here and now, reading that lifts poetry out of the page, off the screen, and into the mouth, where readers and writers celebrate Tracy Smith's shared space. We begin with Kelly Forsyth. Kelly Forsyth is a Pittsburgh native who currently lives in Washington, DC. Her digital chapbook, Helix, was published in 2014 by Floating Wolf Quarterly. And her collection, Perennial, was published by Coffee House Press in 2018. She's published in the American Poetry Review, the Black Warrior Review, the Literary Review, Minnesota Review, and the Columbia Poetry Review. Kelly Forsyth was a former director of publicity for Copper Canyon Press and has been a consultant for the web team at the Poetry Foundation and part of the marketing team at Poets and Writers Magazine. She's currently head of Forsyth Public Relations, a literary agency. Kelly Forsyth can't make it tonight, but her poem Helix, which is featured on the poster, will be read by Marcy Nelligan, who's a jury member and whose poem When You Guide the Rope was featured on one of last year's. Posters. Marcy. Thank you all. I'm really uh, excited to read this beautiful piece, Helix. That you may have been small, Jean, a tiny cross of parental freeways, little fragment of extended tastes, likes, dislikes, hair color, eyes, that our thrills could be found in the departure, a face wearing full honesty and the winters pressing our earrings out of our ears. It is only winter we have to sort our inadequacies against the snow, amber dress, gold ring. As teenagers, we blew invisible candles on plastic cakes, fingertip to fingertip on the kitchen counter. Had we both been planned? Our happening, our ways, the proteins of our limbs. Why not braids or beehives? We know our chemical halves, our sum totals. Here we are, each organic impulse of each, white cursive on mirrors. Are we here? Thank you.
Thanks, Marcy. Next, we have Cassie Garrison. Cassie Garrison is a resident of Lancaster and a recent graduate of Franklin and Marshall College, where she studied English and classical languages and was a star volleyball player. She won a number of grants and awards while at Franklin and Marshall. She was a recipient of the Nisli Scholars Grant, enabling her to travel to Iceland to study Icelandic poetry and the Icelandic landscape. The Hackman Summer Research Grant to go to Greece to explore the lives of Greek emigrants to the United States, and the Allison Ray Drum British Isles Summer Travel Award, which enabled her to get to the UK. Cassie Garrison is a poetry reader for the Adroit Journal and has published her work in the Columbia Journal, Third Point Press, River Sticks, Mojo, Hobart, Penny Dreadful the Nimrod International Journal of Prose and Poetry, where she was a finalist for the 2017 Francine Ringgold Award for New Writers. Please join me in welcoming Cassie Garrison. Hi, uh, I'm really excited to be here and thank you so much for the beautiful poster. Um, so I wanted to start off by reading you guys a, a bit of a longer piece, and it's about six and a half pages, and the piece works within the framework of uh, Dante's Inferno, and I decided to do this because I do a real, I do a yearly read of The Divine Comedy, because um, if you've ever read The Divine Comedy, about 95% of the people you kind of have no idea who they are. And I find that like every year I know more and more people, so it's been sort of an interesting benchmark <laughs> um, for, for my reading. And so this piece is called Descent, Bipolar Disorder as Circles of the Inferno. And before I go into it, I just want to give a content warning because it has content that deals with uh, self-harm. So Descent, Bipolar Disorder as Circles of the Inferno. And the epigraph is, I did not die, and yet I lost life's breath from Canto 34. Nine, purgatory. I stand square over a sore grate, wrist flicked down and pills spilling from their small orange receptacle. Each falls through the rectangular iron lattice into a pool of murky water. Each, when settled, shines like the skull of a decomposing bluefish until eventually it dissolves breaks down into separate elements once more. Eight, lust. I feel my way around a palm-sized body, notice hips emerging from a lump of clay rolled between my fingers. My nails unwillingly slice scars into each torso, side of my hand pressing into the indent of a back. From each clump, I watch the birth of a reluctant and pained Venus, women emerging full-grown from within the folds of a shell chest and pelvis covered by a mane of deep brown hair. In this sculpture, the upper half is being dragged into the cervix of the earth, roots consuming her thighs. In this one, eye socket craters pressed in with a thumb, bridge of the nose a thin slip of moon cutting through the fabric of night. Each one I bake in the oven until solid, no longer malleable. It is these moments that remind me that I am a god of sorts, omnipotent in my own right. I feel myself pushing breath into each of these figures as they harden and become shatterable, mortal. I learn that I can create. Seven, gluttony. I wake. A faceless figure hunches over my bedside, staring into the trench of my body. The figure leans its mouth toward my mouth, hovering just above. No breath comes out. There are no teeth. The figure reaches its tendril fingers and parts my upper and lower lips the way one would the petals of a freshly bloomed flower, only touching where necessary so it does not wilt. It traces the outline of each of my own teeth while I lie, my body unflinching and unable to. It taps each individual molar, canine, incisor, checking its strength, examining the stability. I name this figure Doctor. It looks much more like a plague doctor than any other iteration of a medical professional and comes when I am ill. 
I've read that tooth extraction was a prominent feature of medical practices to treat mental disorders in a wide span of cultures and chronologies. It was believed that evil spirits were compressed within the jaw, and by pulling a tooth, it would relieve pressure and release the presence. The presence. If it did not work, specifically in women, doctors would move down and start to remove each organ one by one until a patient had nothing left but the hollow cavity of their chest. In this way, psychosis and mental disorders were conflated with possession, thought separate from the bodily vesicle and instead an invasion of something exterior. They were an infliction of divine will, a God punishing for some sin or some sin of a relative generations back. I wondered what I had done to open my body up to this kind of presence, to this kind of twin, for this second body to somehow spawn from my own and exit me, become a mirror crooked above my being. Six, greed. I'm standing on the roof of a building. The moon is watching me, one large eye pupilless. The sky is a cyclops. Wherever I move, we are attached by our eyes. My toes are curled. It is winter. The weather is brisk. I am naked. I fear the divine. I am the divine. I feel a wanting, so I drop a shoe. I feel more than a wanting, so I drop another. Why is the eye watching me? Five, anger. I once read a Bible passage that true confession can only occur if a person is nude and suffering from self-inflicted pain, a sacrifice. Transfixed by this idea, I convinced myself I was living an evil life, and I would often strip down, bear before the divine, and bend myself over until my knees and forehead touched to the floor, the cradle of my hips stretched open, inner thighs cold and strained. I see my reflection in the tiled floor, but only barely. When I was seven, my uncle was diagnosed with stomach cancer. He was young, and this was exceptionally difficult for my family. I became preoccupied with the idea that if I gave pain or parts of myself, he would get pieces of his back. I would leave my house during thunderstorms without an umbrella, stand under trees while holding a key or bottle opener or some other shard of metal in my hand. When I was 16, my grandmother got into a car accident and was taken to the hospital. We got the call late one night, saying she would not make it to morning. In our small house, I could hear my parents discussing through the walls. They would tell my sister, brother, and I the next morning, they said, this was past midnight. I wasn't sleeping. If I had suffering to trade parts of myself, my grandmother would live. I took a lighter to my forearm and burned. The flames ate the skin right off my arm. I slid the lighter slowly and watched it wreak havoc on its way swallowing flesh and splitting, spitting blisters and bubbles right back up. Four, heresy. My back is pressed against the barely lit glass, grass. Each dark green silhouette, a small razor. She on top, halo of light rounding the contour of her face. The ground bites at my legs, stings the soft skin between my shoulder blades. Each pulse of my body scratches against the sharp twigs and dried grass below me until I feel myself bleeding. Everywhere, my back covered in a strange tincture of grass and blood. A body occupying another body is possession. A brain occupying another body is illness. A hand occupying another body is sex. Three, violence. In the Greek Orthodox Church, the holiday that equates to Easter is called Pascha. Pascha comes from the same root as the English word passion. It directly translates to suffering. The passion of the Christ, the suffering of the Christ. On Pascha, the entire parish sings a hymn that goes as follows. Christos Anesti, ek nekron, thanato, thanatos. This translates quite literally to, Christ has risen from the dead, death, death. What a cheery song. <laughs> During this hymn, a wooden Christ previously nailed to a wooden cross at the front of the church, is taken down and laid to rest upon a funerary structure called the epitaphio. The entire parish must crawl under this structure on their hands and knees in the candlelit church. This not-so-subtle infatuation and reverence for death 
was not only present in the religion I was raised in, but permeated other aspects of my childhood. Once I found a grub, darkened opal of a body sticking out from a hole in the cement of my front porch. I reached for it with my thumb and forefinger, grabbed. When I pulled it free from the crevice, its fat body erupted. Blood came out the small volcano of its torso. Lava pooled in the palm of my hand. I sat there with the deflated body of the small creature that I had so quickly and easily emptied. Spirit and blood had evacuated to somewhere arcane. I tried to wipe the red off my hands, but with each wipe the stain grew larger. There were streaks across both my palms, my wrists, my forearms, small bloody stigmata, the mark of exodus. Two, fraud. The ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead states that when an animal is separated from the body by violence, it does not go a distance, but remains near it. The soul of whatever has died a violent death seeks out receptacle bodies to possess instead of resting peacefully. At times when my religious faith dwindled, I never stopped believing in the hypothetical of possession, even when I ceased to believe in the hypothetical of God. Possession seemed to span every religious text I entered. Buddhism, voodoo, Wicca, Hinduism, Islam, as well as Southeast Asian and African traditions. It went as far back as the origin of literature itself, and how could something so prominent and permanent not be fact? I often wondered how I could prove that I myself was not possessed. When I was around 15, I began to experience strange urges and thoughts, which I later learned were called intrusive thoughts and a primary symptom of my psychiatric disorder. I used to think my queerness had made me susceptible to this kind of possession, that sin and sexuality had unlocked the repository of my body. Somebody else had taken up residence in my brain, had swallowed the small almond of my amygdala and spit it back up as their own. I'm still unsure which one was there first, which the reality and which the refraction. One, betrayal. Imagine the way in an exorcism, a spirit evacuates the body through the mouth. A person tied down coughs up some sort of Beelzebub as the walls shake and the bed snaps its legs in half splintering from the power of whatever has just left. I drop a pill down my throat. I feel wood splintering inside of me. Um, so I have a couple more pieces that are much shorter, so don't worry about having to hang in there for too long. <laughs> um, so the next one is the one that is on uh, the poster. And this one and the next one are both sort of homages to Sylvia Plath. Um, and I tried to, um, yeah, so this one's called Prayer to Lady Lazarus after her poem, Lady Lazarus. Again, curled beneath a willow, spreading its branches, an ancient umbrella in a biblical downpour that falls as needles, skewers the wings of dragonflies. I fashion a crown, golden laurel, halo barely lit, flickering low. The last time I saw her, she slid a key into a socket her eyes dark and sunken peach pits, hair scarcely remained. The time before, she stood outside for seven days, bent a piece of metal around her chest, then waited for the storm to end. Oh, mother, do not tell me I am in a body that is violent, but rather a single horse hair snapped over the neck of a violin. Mother, do not worry. God promised the world would not end with water again. Also, just so you know, the last poem is a love poem, just to like pivot you through the less happy poems, <laughs> give you like a light at the end of the tunnel here. <laughs> um, so this poem is called Hippocratic Love Song, and as homage to Sylvia Plath again, it's after her poem, Mad Girl's Love Song. Hello, doctor. The pain is a river that does not end, is a bell that splits and splits but never silences. Morning. I drape a robe of flesh over my bones. By the time the steady musculature of night overtakes the sky, I am raw again. Doctor of bodily torments, doctor of strange anatomy, become my intimate. Come to know my body like it is a lover, the way my knee does not flinch when it should, uneven cartography of my kidney, churning and retching beneath my rib. 
Trace your finger down the shattered mountain range of my vertebrae, doctor. Come to know my body like it is your own. And so the next one is the last poem before the happy poem. So um, it is called I Am the Boy, and it's sort of a poem about like queer violence, but also um, being like kind of giving birth to yourself in some ways, um, in a not literal way. So <laughs> definitely not a literal way. <laughs> So it's called, I am the boy. I am the boy made of a thousand locusts, boy woven from a steady necromancy of stone and flesh, bone and amber. I assemble and rise at the pull of a finger, boy belt of raindrops, tender murmurations falling from the sky, boy fashioned on the anvil of a blacksmith, every strike sharper, more merciless, my hands red and malleable, I am the boy beaten into a wall behind the bar, each punch uneasy and piercing the night like the tip of a needle, boy whose bruises linger into a constellation. I am the boy who has known the steady witchcraft of disguise, that two can meld into one and three can give way to something holy. I am a body with a seed in my throat and my spine bent like the stem of a hyacinth. And so my, the last poem that I'm going to read for you is called A Study in Lavender, and I actually stole this name. There's this metery by, in Lancaster, and it also has axe throwing. And so <laughs> A Study in Lavender is the name of a mead there, <laughs> um, if you ever need a good place for mead and axe throwing. <laughs> a stu oh, and it's also a sonnet. I feel like I have to say that. I do write in form once every like 400 poems. So, <laughs> a study in lavender. Before dawn stretched her rosy fingers onto earth, before I threw a stone into the eye socket of a storm and it broke like a cloud of wasps gone haywire, she, like an oil painting, sprawled in the silence of morning, went with tired breath to the forest alone. Well, not completely. She had the moon, her brooding cheekbones tugged high and sighs of dried grass to carve scars into her ankles as she bent to gather petals of lavender, separating from stalk with ease. She did not have the stars, for they had faded and left behind their traces, small and pale as burnt out candlesticks smudged into an awestruck sky. So thank you guys for... <laughs> Next, we'll move on to Sarah Blake. Sarah Blake uh, earned an MFA in poetry here at Penn State, and she won a literature fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts in 2013. In 2015, she published her first collection of poetry, Mr. West, an unauthorized biography of Kanye West with Wesleyan University Press. And in 2000, 2017, also with Wesleyan University Press, Let's Not Live on Earth. Nice title. Uh, in 2016, she published an e-chap book entitled Named After Death through Banango Editions. Sarah Blake is a contributor of interviews and features to the Chicago Review of Books. Her novel, Nama, is uh, due to be published any month now this year from Riverhead Books. Her current project is entitled In a Wood with Clearings, It's Spring, which is a narrative in 60 prose poems. Sarah Blake's poem, Lot's Wife Dreaming, is on video, I believe. I'm really excited to be here. 
uh, and I'm really grateful and I'm really glad that Caroline had this idea that I could maybe videotape in my reading for this evening. Uh, and I wanted to say thank you so much to Caroline and Tom and congratulations to the other poets and hello to any of my old professors that might be in the room. So I'm going to read uh, poems from this project I've been working on where I'm retelling the stories of women in Genesis. Uh, and I'm going to read four poems and end in the poem that's it on the poster. Uh, and then I thought I'd read the opening of my novel that's just coming out next week because that retells the story of Nema. But I'll talk more about that when I get there. So this first poem uh, is Dinah. It's about Dinah and it's called Dinah. So quick were the men to agree to circumcision. They all stumbled around the city for days. Then my brothers killed them, blessed their rampaging teenage hearts. I'd take up a sword for them too. I've been practicing in my tent. With the blade, I catch the canvas and then I mend it myself. Maybe if I'd been the one to take each limp penis in my hands, maybe that would have been enough. So all the women in the project that I'm writing these persona poems for get at least one poem where they're dreaming because I wanted to allow them a little bit more space and surreal space outside of their stories that we know. So this is Dinah's dreaming. Any woman's dreamt of killing men. I dream of strangling one from behind with a long soft cloth wrapped tight around my knuckles. So we're connected, my joints to his neck, the most tactile pieces of my body to his breath, his voice, his Adam's apple, his first seven vertebrae, his thyroid cartilage, his ache, after too much time spent looking in any one direction, and his hyoid bone, which supports the tongue, the tongue which forms the words, and he says, only give me the young woman as my wife. My fingers hold those words now to shove into any mouth I'd like, and my palms, not cut by any wire, my hands kept how men like, still able to sit down to breakfast with my father and brothers, nothing giving me away, no blood on the bread. So this next poem is Lot's Wife. Sure, I was a pillar of salt for a minute, but then I was a woman again, hand still holding the hand of an angel. I was happy right where I was. I kissed the angel, and the angel kissed me back like I was the tequila, the lime, and the salt all at once. I could feel the heat of a burning city to one side of me, the angel's body to the other, and the winds of the plains kept pushing that heat into me like they knew I still had some cold spots, places that hadn't been touched. The angel swept me up and hid me in a cave until we knew everyone remembered me as Lot's wife, or salt. Then we built a house we never left. Everyone thought I was a warning against sin instead of a woman who got everything she ever wanted, never could have known she wanted until that angel came down to save me and licked me like a horse. And this is the poem that will be on the poster. It's called Lot's Wife's Dreaming. Sometimes I'm salt again. Sometimes the wind feels like a man I didn't say yes to. The world breaks down into minerals, the blood volume of every blooded body controlled by the minerals, the question to the men at sea, always the minerals, and the sea is just a future desert and the body's just a future desert. The mermaid is taking seawater in and out of her mouth, so she's already full of salt and made of salt. Sometimes I'm in the sea. Sometimes I am the sea, and I smash a ship and drown the men. Other times I'm sprinkled on a dish or added to the butter with such restraint. So what had begun as poems about Nema retelling the story of Noah's Ark from his wife's perspective, who goes 
unnamed in Genesis. Uh, but she, but that's her name from leptogenesis. Uh, though I'm not pronouncing it correctly, I kind of made it my own for when I was reconstructing that world for her. Uh, and those those poems led to a novel. Uh, so this is the prologue of the novel, and it has this back and forth with direct quotes from Genesis. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. This may have been true. And if he'd told them that, they might have understood more. They might have learned that what ran through each of them, what they all felt, could in fact be named. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And while God would act harshly, he would not act impulsively. And between his deciding to destroy all things and the act of doing so, he came to know Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet, with Nama. Nama was the first one to know Noah to be a just man and perfect in his generations. Nama married him before God ever spoke to him. She bore Japhet first, then Shem, then Ham, though at some point Shem fell into the position of the baby of the family, spoiled and watched over. And Noah's walks with God continued every afternoon and sometimes into the night as Nama raised the boys. When Noah brought home God's command to build the ark, Nama helped him to make a model of the ark out of stalks of grass. How can we do this? Noah asked. And though neither of them could answer, they began the work of it. And everything that is in the earth shall die, but with thee will I establish my covenant. They hurried their boys to marry, and they did without difficulty. Japhet married Adada, Ham, Nila, Shem, Sadie. Then there were eight of them to build. They worked for years. At night they left and ate with their families. They played with children in the dirt. It was impossible for them to envision the destruction of the world. And why should they? Noah and Nema shook with their imaginings. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. How can we do this? Noah asked Nema again. If we don't, we'll die, she answered. They were sitting on their bed. Maybe we should die, he said, if every one of us is wicked. No, she said, and she took him in her arms because he had begun to cry. If I am sure of anything, I am sure that you and our children should not die. He did not say anything. I need you to be sure of it too, Noah. She pushed him away from herself. I need for you, when you look at me, to be overwhelmed with the feeling that I should not die. He looked at her and nodded slowly. You don't feel it, she said. I want to. What about our sons? Do you want them to die? He shook his head. But you think that maybe they should. He nodded, and she stormed around their bed keeping her eyes up so he could see how she did not look at him. Is it not love? He shouted at her. She stopped and put her face very close to his. Love is protecting them. Neither of them said anything for a long time. They stayed in that position as if she could pin the thought into his head with her eyes. Are you with me? He asked her. I'm always with you, she said. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark. When the rains began, Noah's doubt left him. When the rains continued, his guilt left him. When the waters were high enough to lift the ark from the earth, he and all the family were asleep. When they woke, they were adrift. And what was remarkable to them all was that they could not feel the difference between the earth covered with life and the earth barren of it. They each had thought they'd feel it somewhere in their bodies, their chest or gut or bones, but none of them did. And the waters prevailed upon the earth. There was a time then when God forgot about the ark on the flood waters. It was not a long time for God, but it was a long time. Enough that the family began to feel as if they had always been adrift, the waking to water every day, flat and blue and everywhere. 
When someone dies and you forget how they look or how they laughed, that is how they forgot the land. But only Nama mourned it. The rest of them were merely eager to see it again. Nama sometimes imagined the water was land, that she could stand on it and face the boat, which she refused to call an ark anymore, disenchanted with it in these weeks with the animals rowdy and foul. From the surface of the water, the side of the boat seemed insurmountable, too big to be real. But given time and tools, she thought she could climb it. She could solve it. Naaman knew that the true difficulty was in her own position on the boat. All right, well, thank you again for having me. Uh, it's really my pleasure and uh, I can't wait. I hope there's a, re a recording of all of you reading that I can watch. All right. Thank you again. Bye. We'll conclude with Emily Grossholtz, familiar to many of us. Uh, Emily Grossholtz is the Edwin or is Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Philosophy, English, and African American Studies here at Penn State. As a philosopher and poet, she's published extensively in both areas. Uh, her two most recent books are The Stars of Earth, New and Selected Poems, published by Word Galaxy in 2017, and Great Circles, The Transits of Mathematics and Poetry, published by Springer. 2018. Perhaps her preface to Great Circles explains this binary disciplinarity. And she writes, in general, I argue that poetry stands in the same relation to the humanities as mathematics stands to the sciences. Both disciplines generate insight by highly concentrated modes of expression in which formal structure is just as important as content in the creation of meaning. Thus, in these disciplines, close attention to form and to forms in combination is essential to the interpretation of texts. The philosopher must also balance an appreciation of timeless form with an historian's sense of the temporality of proof and discovery as human actions and the changing cultural context of poems. Welcome, Emily Grossel. So with that introduction, um, I uh, am going to explain a little bit that poem there because one of the crucial words in that poem is analysis. And in uh, Greek culture, analysis is a search for the solvability, the conditions of solvability of problems in math. And then if you go to my favorite philosopher, Leibniz analysis is also the search for conditions of intelligibility. How is this world understandable? Okay, so, <laughs> and, and that is the word in, in uh, Homer analysis, comes up right there. Penelope. Penelope held off her ravenous suitors by promising tomorrow and tomorrow she'd finish lost Ulysses' winding sheet. The Greek text says that she composed in light and analyzed in darkness. Woven figures unraveled are not quite analysis, rather a woman trying to understand the altitude and basis of her island. All day Penelope addressed the warp, her shuttle, a small craft with two directions. All night her solitude relit the torch. To analyze is to set life in question, despite the crush of suitors at the door, the cold synthetic wave raking the shore.
So for the rest of the poems, I'm going to read poems that are in part related to here and there. Because as I was growing up, not only did I want to be a mathematician and a poet, just like Omar Khayyam, becoming the mathematician was too complicated 50 years ago. Uh, but um, I also wanted to be Odysseus and Penelope. <laughs> so, uh, so I will read uh, a poem that Ted Kuzer uh, chose for his online, uh, what do you call it, uh, American Life and Poetry. Um, and it's called Here and There. I should also explain, anemone in Greek means windflower. I was thinking, well, what could I take to my mom? Um, you know, if up there we're all in disembodied. Windflower. What will I miss when I'm gone? The squeak of the wheelbarrow's wheel? Side notes that strike with every slow revolution and then the hushed, rusty answers in triplets from the invisible birds and the lackluster maples. Branches, weeds, last autumns, leavings, wake, raked from the moss-eaten paths, beds, borders, still untrimmed hedges. Also, the silent pale blue bells of my half-dozen borage, ringed, self-seeded from the woods. Daylilies, my mother used to set roadside in June. Pale Greek anemones, she never traveled far enough to find wild as I did once or twice. But maybe I'll bring her son some if their wind flowers blow beside a cloudy sea. Now I'm going to read a poem I wrote here when I was sitting in class myself because I've taken lots of classes in the math department. Okay, I couldn't figure out how to be a mathematician, but I could still take graduate classes and find out about stuff. So the person who I most enjoyed taking classes from was Winnie Lee, who is a really wonderful uh, number theorist in our math department. So probably the most important result in the last part of the, tw of the 20th century was the proof of Fermat's last theorem by Andrew Wiles. Uh, and when I got back here, after sort of finding out about it when we were in England 20 years ago, Winnie Lee was teaching a whole course on that proof, leading you through the proof. So I took like about five classes from her over the past 15 years. Now, while I was um, but while I was taking those classes, I was also reading travel books, and sometimes those travel books took me to the Taklamakan Desert, which connects Persia and China. Elliptic curves and modular forms converge south of the Taklamakan. Why don't we write more poems in praise of our, of our teachers? You know? <laughs> a skein of silk amid the iron and bronze weapons, the trade routes brought my number theory teacher, Dr. Lee, who writes faster with white chalk on the blackboard than any human being I ever followed across a proof raising clouds of chalk dust at the furrowed extremities of each long expedition towards a theorem. Camels cough and huddle by the caravanserai in moonlight. I 
carry cough drops with me in my book bag under notes so I won't interrupt her train of thought by sneezing and try to copy every line she writes as well as those brief detours on heuristics or her mild evaluations of depth or usefulness or interest of conjectures placed unexpectedly like waterfalls down clefts in limestone or her infrequent offhand explanations of the way she generalized a printed remark of Sayre from gamma zero pi sorry p <laughs> p prime indexing groups of matrices to any level how algebraic form can complement the smooth analysis that frames the proof the complex upper half plane posed like some great violet dome on whose connected face the primes come out appearing one by one in constellations above the Taklamakan desert where the silk route ran from Qian between the winding yellow river and the great but perished wall to break against the lovely gates of Kashgar. And here is one of my Greek poems. Uh, 45 years ago, I spent some time on a Greek island, the Greek island of Egina, on one side of the, of the island, with the most amazing view. It was really hard to live there because you had to walk up this hill a really long time to get up there. You had to bring out all your food and all your water, but it was worth it. So this is one of a memory from, from that time. It's called Just a Star. An olive tree can live a thousand years, drawing its silver leaves and oval fruit from stony terraces, fretting the wind in registers of sun-inflected shadow. But we, my love, who count the terraces rising to meet the stories of the sky, who cultivate the olive groves, who hear the interruption in the trees as music and weep responsive to those minor chords, can live only a century, no more. Although I love you, you are just a man, and the great silver sun is just a star. Uh, all four of my children took piano lessons because partly when I was a kid, we didn't have enough money for piano lessons. I always wanted to have piano lessons. And their teacher was Leslie Beers, who was teaching the Suzuki method. Uh, and so this is called First Piano Lesson. And uh, it also reminds us of Monet Giverny that lovely garden and the lovely Japanese uh, bridge in the middle of that garden and the, the curve of that bridge and the way in which he painted it that turns it into a rainbow. So I should say also, uh, so my, I, my two older kids um, learned to play the piano and the two younger kids uh, were sort of listening to them going, how do they do that? They'd go up and they'd bang on the piano and go, ah, it's not working. How come they, how come, how can they do that? And then they had their first piano lesson. And in Suzuki lessons, you, you start going from G, sorry, from C to G. And you call it rainbowing up because you have to lift your hand up to go from C to G. You can't just go like that. First piano lesson. Some years, they have been pressing, sorry, Say it again. for years they have been pressing the white keys, sometimes the black, occasionally haphazardly great fingerfuls together. But where exactly was the music, they wondered? Gone. Today, they built a bridge from 
C to G, as if across Giverny's garden pond. Perhaps it is a rainbow. G to C, oral, slant visible, inevitable, clear. They stand amazed around the grand piano, capable at last of lifting up from sound's long restlessness the dripping, glittery net of intervals and in its knotted strings, that golden fish, a song. One of the things that I noticed when I was writing my book about poetry and mathematics is the way in which parabolas and hyperbolas and ellipses all have literary meanings. We use them all the time without really thinking about that. And this came up uh, in when my kids started saying funny things, it often inspired poems. So uh, one of my kids. So this is, this is like, they're just beginning to, to, to talk and they're saying funny things. So this is called the shape of desire, which is, in this case, the parabola. Tracing an airplane's pale trajectory, you always point and finish, airplane gone. Waking from dreams about your babysitter's dark-eyed clever daughter, you conclude, Lulu gone, and hurry to the door's long window pane to see her reappear freshly composed from memory and clouds. Now you can say the shape of your desire. Now you believe that each sidereal item carries a left-hand banner to describe through curl and dissipation how it was that every friend is summoned by a name, even in parting. You are wrong and right about the frail parabolas of love. Uh, I have a few more minutes. OK, so I'm going to read a poem about Easterly Parkway. How many people know Easterly Parkway? Primary school. My four children learn to read here, to talk back and repent. In the principal's office, to unlock the ivory puzzle box of the multiplication tables, to learn a few lovely phrases of Japanese, to marry and give birth and die in imaginary covered wagons, laboring from St. Louis to Sacramento. Today, my daughter read an essay to the assembly, and my youngest son played a Mozart air on his fiddle. So for the last time, I visited their first school, Easterly, namesake perhaps of the morning star that shines only a little while before and after dawn, though secretly it is also the evening star and the errant planet, Venus. Fourteen years under this tangle of elm trees, lindens, black walnuts, pin oaks that rust bronze in October, maples that launch their bright wings downwards in April. I wrote my name on a paper badge marked visitor and kept it afterwards as if it might somehow later reopen the doors sealed now by the guardian of years. Right. I will read one more. So this is about the glacial moraine that we live in. You know, you look at the, the Tussie Ridge, right? And then there's the other ridges, and then there's the other ridges, and they go on and on. It's glacial moraine. Uh, so this is about one time when I went out for a walk with my kids and one of my brothers um, 
because we live on the edge of town, sort of like across from the YMCA. Uh, and when we came back, we saw something that I have never seen before or after, which was an entire giant tree completely full of fireflies. You know, I mean, since then I've seen, you know, some parts of a tree with fireflies, but like an entire giant tree completely covered with fireflies, that's the stars of Earth, and that's just the beginning of my book. The stars of Earth. Come away, come away now, we whispered to the children, who that summer's night were plastered to the noisy screen of their electric muses. Cell phone, television, texting, word. They tumbled from their couches anyway, half roused, and followed blindly across the street and up the hill beside the churches, far from the edge of cornfields, looking down the valley's darkness and further away the darkness of uneven glacial hills, moraine fashioned 50,000 years ago, years when there was no summer. Darkness everywhere, and four awed children shivering in the warmth. And as we turned back home, we came to a tree on fire with fireflies, a veteran oak encrusted from head to crown with tiny disturbances that pulsed and blazed as if they sang of love, but sang in silence. Now, don't forget, we are going to have our poetry signing and our book sale. And we want to say thank you to the Penn State Bookstore and Bill Keister for being here tonight. But before we go, please join me in one more thank you for our incredible poets tonight. Kelly Forsyth, Cassie Garrison, Sarah Blake, Emily Groschultz, our MC Bill Brockman, and our reader Marcy Nelligan. And thanks to each of you for being here as well. Thank you.